is the Sam Sorbo Show. Discover an easy and simple drug-free antidote to overcome alcoholism, drugs, smoking, and other various addictions with a simple app, Discover Cure Stress. With the Cure Stress app, you can begin to walk away from addiction, break the endless loop of negative thoughts, or resolve relationship difficulties. It can even help you cope with PTSD. Change your life without effort in just seven minutes with the Cure Stress app, free and available now on Apple App Store and Android Google Play. You've walked through 18 open houses, your feet hurt, and your head is buzzing. Living in a van is starting to sound strangely appealing, but then you hear it. The sound of hope, of Zillow. You glance at your phone to see a three-bedroom craftsman in the right school district. It's perfect, and it just showed up on your phone, like magic. So sign up for mobile alerts, and we'll send you homes that fit your criteria when they hit the market. And to think, you wanted to live in a van. Zillow. Find your way home. Have you heard about the superfood discovered by Olympic athletes? Beets are a nutritional goldmine, but instead of trying to drink all that beetroot juice, I take Super Beets to get the same benefit. Super Beets helps you create nitric oxide, boosting circulation and healthy blood pressure levels. SamBeatsAll.com is a new website to check it out. It gives me energy, stamina, and helps me focus. Go to SamBeatsAll.com now for my special offer. Call 800-201-7450 or go to SamBeatsAll.com. Get a 30-day supply for free. It comes with your first order and is backed by a money-back guarantee. You also receive the free book, Beat the Odds, and free shipping on your entire order. You'll love the results you feel with your first free canister guaranteed or your money back. All of this comes with free shipping and a 100% money-back guarantee. So call 800-201-7450 or go to sambeatsall.com. 800-201-7450. Again, 800-201-7450 or go to... If you're considering putting hardwood, bamboo, or laminate floors in your home, there's only one thing you need, a free Lumber Liquidators catalog. Lumber Liquidators has unbeatable prices and the best selection of high-quality flooring anywhere. Call 800-258-5079 for your free catalog. It's filled with great tips, ideas, and deals on hardwood, bamboo, and laminate floors. We buy direct from the mills, so you get the best quality at incredibly low prices. The Hardwood Floor Hotline is open 24-7 at 800-258. 85079 to request your free catalog and see for yourself how we can help you get that gorgeous new floor you've been dreaming of. Hardwood floors add beauty and value to your home. So call 800-258-5079 today and we'll rush you your free catalog. Get the hardwood floor you've always wanted for prices you never thought possible. But you must call now. Call 800-258-5079. That's 800-258-5079. Again, 800-258-5079. Talk health, talk wealth, talk politics. Talk 1470, WNN. Talk 1470, WWNN, Pompano Beach, Boca Raton, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Be sure to catch the Ask the Experts show every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. with celebrity hosts Steve-O and Renee as they interview local experts in the field of law, health, financial, and home improvement on AM 1470 WNN. This program is brought to you by Fresh Start Tax. Fresh Start Tax offers a full range of tax and accounting services, including tax return preparation and bookkeeping, as well as back taxes, wage garnishments, unfiled returns, or any other tax-related concern. Our dedicated team of tax attorneys, CPAs, and former IRS agents offer over 60 years of professional tax experience. For a free consultation, call 866-700-1040. That's 866-700-1040. You can also visit us on the web at freshstarttax.com. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. The content of the following program, including all statements from the host and guests, is to provide general information and commentary about the law. Under no circumstances does any statement made by a host or guest to a caller or listener constitute legal advice or the formation of an attorney-client relationship, and the material from this program should not be viewed as a substitute for personal consultation with an attorney. Welcome to Talk Legal with Jeff Van Treese, who brings you all the latest news in the legal world. 
Jeff will be discussing a variety of legal topics with experts in the field. If you would like to ask a question or share a story on the air, please call toll-free 888-565-1470. Once again, that's 888-565-1470. Now, let's talk legal with Jeff Van Trees. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Talk Legal. I'm your host, Jeff Van Trees. I'm an attorney with the law firm Oltman, Flynn and Kubler, where we practice intellectual property, including patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Uh, you can check us out online and view all episodes of this show by visiting our website at oltmanpatent.com. That's O-L-T-M-A-N-P-A-T-E-N-T dot com. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of our listeners, both, both those of you tuning in on the AM dial as well as watching online. If you have a question, comment, or story that you would like to share on the air, please feel free to call us toll-free at 888-565-1470. We welcome your calls. I have uh, some very special guests in studio this evening. I have Ken Ronan. Ken is a partner with the law firm Laval, Brown & Ronan in Boca Raton. Uh, actually, we, I had his uh, law partner, Jeff Brown, on a, on a few occasions in recent months. Uh, Ken is a former prosecutor. He currently practices personal injury and criminal defense, and he is the assistant, excuse me, he's the vice chairman of the Tri-County Humane Society. Uh, this evening, we're going to be discussing some issues, some legal issues related to animals, uh, but we're going to talk about a few other things first that have been happening in, uh, in the news. Also joining us this evening is Amanda Chesler. She's the assistant director of the Tri-County uh, Humane Society. So I'd like to welcome you both to Talk Legal. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank so uh, we're going to get to some of these issues relating to animal law in a minute, but we, I have to talk about the, the developments in Baltimore, the riots that have been taking place. Uh, they, this has been in the aftermath of the death of a 25-year-old man named uh, Freddie Gray, uh, who was arrested uh, because he was running away from the police on April 12th of this year, uh, there was, that appeared to have been the probable cause was that he was running away. Uh, they tackled him and uh, he was taken in an ambulance where he died after suffering a severe injury to his cervical spine. Uh, I think it was 80% uh, crushed uh, to, to my knowledge. He also had uh, other injuries, internal injuries. His trachea was damaged uh, and he died en route to the hospital. Today uh, and yesterday, there have been riots, a uh, number of injuries, no fatalities uh, as of yet, uh, and this uh, seems to be uh, a very heartbreaking scenario, and of course the aftermath is, uh, is, is uh, certainly very disappointing. Uh, as a former prosecutor, you know, you're looking at this case, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Well, my, my thoughts about the case uh, right away was, of course, what a tragedy, what a horrible thing to happen in today's day and age and with uh, some of the other cases of this type that we've been seeing coming uh, uh, and that we hear about in the news. It's amazing that it continues to happen. But I guess as a, uh, 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 as a former uh, prosecutor, I would uh, think that um, without knowing what any of the reports say in this case, that... Uh, uh, the police in this uh, case are going to have a very hard time explaining uh, uh, that anything, that this could have happened in any other way uh, other than in, in a way would make them responsible. You know, you have a situation where the standard of probable cause, which is that uh, under the Constitution, under the Fifth Amendment, a police officer, in order to arrest someone, has to have probable cause uh, that a crime has been committed and that the person they're arresting is the person that committed the crime. In a situation like this where he's simply running, he, he just he sees the police, he runs, it's 8.30 in the morning. Uh, you know, is that enough for probable cause, in your opinion? Well, uh, there's a, a, a case law on that point. They're allowed to investigate a, a suspicious incident. Uh, if they ask uh, the individual to stop, uh, they should do that. So there's probable cause I to to I think uh, get his identification to see why he's running you know that sort of thing um, but beyond that I mean I, I, I don't know what the facts are so it's hard to comment 
Yeah, it, it is a it's a difficult situation because we haven't heard anything that would indicate that the officers felt they were in danger. He was running away from them, and he had multiple people tackling him. Uh, you know, similar to the uh, Eric Garner case that occurred last y- last year, uh, end of last year, where he was put into a chokehold and he couldn't breathe, uh, and then and then he he died as a result of those injuries. Uh, in this case, there there's a Justice Department investigation. There's a police investigation. Uh, but, you know, we have these riots. There was a CVS that was burned and looted, and fortunately no loss of life yet, you know, that occurred, but certainly uh, it could have. There could have been serious injuries. Uh, you know, how, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts about the, uh, the response of the public officials as far as bringing in the National Guard and, you know, essentially imposing martial law on the city? Well, uh, from what I've read and, and, and what has occurred, it, it seems like a responsible act at this point. And, and it's a shame that we have to go through this. Uh, and they had to make those very tough decisions. And there's been this, uh, I understand, uh, about 15 officers have been hurt, six seriously, uh, millions and millions of dollars loss of property. As you said, the CVS <coughs> store was um, more than that building was burned. And the thought that occurred to me immediately was the Walter Scott case where we had none of those problems, where <clears throat> it was caught on video. And immediately responsibility was taken and very swiftly so, uh, uh, the officer involved was uh, charged and that seemed to placate everybody. So you got the, it begs the question, what can we do now in the law in today's day and age with this climate, with, what, with what's going on in these situations, how can we avoid it? And I think that with today's technology, if there was more video, more audio, it might uh, prevent some of this. And that, that was one of the great things, you know, with that, it was a horrible tragedy, but one of the, uh, you know, fortunate things is that it was caught on tape with the uh, Walter Scott case in Charleston, South Carolina, and of course the, the murder charge against the officer followed immediately. Like you said, that did, that did uh, satisfy the public for the most part. Uh, in this case, when you don't have the events on tape, people are left to their imaginations as to what what might have happened, and that's when you're more likely to have this on un, this unrest because the prosecutor is in a situation where they can't bring charges necessarily without definitive proof, and uh, that's that's when you're going to have a situation where people are going to be dissatisfied. Yeah, exactly. They're they're left to their imagination. That's the problem. So now there's going to be, I would imagine, a lengthy investigation. Uh, no definitive answers anytime soon, um, and you know, hopefully they can um, uh, s- uh, stop what's going on in Baltimore. Um, perhaps it will cool down swiftly, but uh, this could have been avoided I, if if you had more technology involved. Is are my initial thoughts. And the other thing that I, I think we have to take note of is a lot of civil rights leaders. Uh, that are calling for an investigation have found this looting and the people that are perpetrating uh, a lot of these, a lot of this uh, criminal activity during these riots are ultimately distracting from the ultimate issue, which is that there needs to be an investigation into the officer's conduct. This takes everyone's attention away from that and, and turns it into, you know, looking at the riots rather than looking at what could be the victim of a crime here. Uh, could be a manslaughter, could be second degree murder, who knows, you know, like you said, the results of that investigation might be way off into the future. Uh, so it's, you know, it's going to be interesting. We hope that the city of Baltimore will, uh, you know, maintain order in the near future and, you know, martial law will no longer be necessary. Uh, I agree. And uh, well, I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah. So we'll be following that story uh, closely. Uh, you know, turning our attention to what we were originally going to talk about this evening. Uh, the Tri-County Humane Society, that's something that uh, you are the, uh, the vice chairman of. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about it and what the mission of the uh, Humane Society is. Well, the, the mission of the, the main mission of the Tri-County Animal Rescue, as that it's now called, is uh, we are a no-kill animal facility in the Tri-County area, right here in Boca Raton. Uh, just a little bit about the history of it. Uh, the Ritters were a family in town that owned the property that's out in uh, West Boca Raton. In, uh, I guess, in the late 90s, uh, the city uh, leased the property to the Tri-County uh, Animal 
facility, I guess it was called at that time. Mm -hmm. Jeanette Christos and Susie Goldsmith were the founders. Uh, Jeanette Christos is now deceased. Susie's still there working tirelessly. And with me on my left today is Amanda, who's an assistant uh, there with uh, Susie. And what we do is we take in animals from all over. Right now, I think they're in Tennessee uh, rescuing an animals. That, uh, and what the, the concept is, is to have a place where you can bring uh, uh, unwanted uh, animals, cats, dogs. And uh, right now, I think we have about 300 at the facility, did we you say? We do. 150 dogs, 150 cats, and one pig. And <laughs> and what we do is find them homes, and it's it's a non-kill uh, facility, so uh, they are not going to leave unless they're going to a good home. We will not let these animals go to a different a shelter that euthanizes. Um, and so, uh, for the most part, we are able to adopt all the animals. How many a year, Amanda? Uh, close to four thousand. Four thousand a year, fifty-two thousand since we've been there. Um, the nice part about our facility is that they don't have expiration dates. So at the end of the day, I go home, they're all going to be there the next morning. And it's really a sanctuary for these animals to stay. We become their families, the employees and volunteers. And it's a, it's a beautiful place to work and be and, you know, be an animal, be a cat and dog. So Amanda, if you could tell us a little bit about the no-kill policy. Does that mean that if you reach capacity that you can't bring any more animals in? I mean, you, you have a finite amount of space. So, I mean, that's generally... We do, we do have a capacity issues, but we overcome them. I have three in my office right now. We've turned bathrooms into out-of-order signs and put them in there. Um, we find the space. Thankfully, we have 11 acres. Uh, we have trailers and clinics and, and more space we find every single day. So if there is a room or a closet or behind the lobby desk, we're going to find that space. And what's the best way that people can reach you in the event that uh, they have that an animal has to be placed, or where they can adopt uh, an animal, or uh, or where they can donate? Well, what's the best What's the best way to reach you? Thank you for the donate comment because we are building a ten thousand square foot facility right now, and I uh, that is it's a it's a facility that works on nothing but donations. So. Um, Yes, Amanda, we do which, not get any funding from the city, state, or government. Uh, no tax money. It's all private donations. So you can go to our website, tricountyanimalrescue.com. That is also where you can find out how to volunteer, how to be part of us, um, sponsor an animal, sponsor a run. We need your help. So I'd, I'd like to transition into uh, you know something that's been in the Florida legislature recently passed, uh, which is greyhounds and the, uh, and the now the required reporting of greyhound injuries to the state of Florida. Uh, does your facility have any greyhounds that you've taken in? Uh, we don't have any right now, but we do. We have seen them. Um, you know, we have a track 30 minutes north of us, and it's something we hear about every day. And I think it, it's 2015. It's time for a change. We need to shut it down. You shut down, that is, to, to illegalize the Correct. greyhound racing. Mm -hmm. uh, so this bill doesn't do that. It doesn't no, make uh, uh, <laughs> greyhound racing illegal. And there's some very powerful. Oh, there's, oh, there's some very powerful business interests that you'll have to overcome in order mm -hmm. to accomplish that. Uh, you know, there's the there's the gambling lobby among other things, but the you know this bill uh, which just passed uh, in the Florida legislature requires reporting of injuries to the state, uh, and this is this is a bill that is supported by greyhound breeders because uh, they say that this is an alternative to stricter regulations. Whenever you hear something like that, it, it, it sort of makes you suspicious. But, but they're saying that they, they like this legislation um, because it doesn't, does not require that or does not prohibit them from medicating greyhounds, which I, which I recently learned is a common practice uh, to enhance their performance on the track. Uh, nor does this bill require any enhanced safety equipment, uh, which is something that would be expensive and the uh, the gambling industry and the breeders uh, uh, don't want to do that either. Um, so th they seem to be happy with it. Uh, there's, you know, it's it, the bill itself was passed in response to the fact that one greyhound is euthanized in the state of Florida every three days, which is unfortunate and, and pretty overwhelming. Uh, but from the legal perspective, you know, uh, what, what do you think about this law? Do you think this is going to uh, have an effect, and do you think that it, it's going to be enforced? Uh, that's actually probably the, the most significant thing is, is this law enforceable? Well, uh, the reporting requirement is 18 hours after death that has to, has to be reported. And this is, um, uh, 
uh, the result of uh, a change in industry. It started in the 1990s. It's been a, a, a in decline. Uh, there was a time when I think that the gambling at these uh, at the dog racing uh, facilities was close to a million dollars a year. Now I think in the state of Florida, which has I believe has the most greyhound facilities in in the country, uh, it's about 250 million. And it's all tied into um, that they have to keep the live uh, races going so they can keep the poker playing and the, and the machines in place. Because if they do away with the uh, Greyhound racing, then they're just casinos. And so there's a lot out there now. It's called decoupling of the, uh, the, the two, the, the gambling interest and the... Um, and the uh, interest of the of the greyhound uh, in the industry, and, um, uh, and Maria Sachs uh, in Delray, uh, Senator Sachs from the state of Florida, is uh, very supportive of doing away completely with the greyhound uh, racing and decoupling it from uh, the gambling uh, interest. Uh, then this has been going on now for you know a number of years but it's getting a lot more attention now it's getting a lot more traction the bill that you just brought up uh, I think it was last spring or something when it um, they started uh, actually it got passed and uh, I don't know how they're doing on enforcement but um, um, I think the prediction is that they will be doing away with the Greyhound race that's where you think it's going to go and eventually well it's not profitable it loses money it, it's uh, as I read that uh, it's a 35 million dollar loss for the, the, the track owners don't want to do Greyhound racing they they make their money in the poker as I understand it and the and the uh, uh, other gambling um, and it is something that the gamblers themselves can't really partake in it's not like it's poker where they're actually getting to, to play they're just sort of betting on a on a on a dog or if it's you know, right. horse racing it's a horse but in this case we're talking about greyhounds they're just they're just betting and then you know they're, they're going to lose money in the long run anyway yeah uh, true and i think the people attending these facilities are are uh, they're just not uh, betting on the races as much as they used to the live races with the dogs they are uh, other places in the track has the the poker and the uh, uh slot machines and that's that's what's um where the track owners are making their money. As I understand it, the breeders, of course, want to keep the Greyhound uh, race going, going, and the, the trainers, et cetera. So that's, those are the people that are involved. And, uh, but uh, all the statistics lead to the concept that uh, uh, that might be going away. You know, this could be just a sign of uh, a sense of social responsibility that people have. Uh, you know, you look at how the, the rates of, People, you know, eating healthier right. today. Uh, people, you know, fewer people. Many, much lower percentage of the population smokes than they used to, and people are now caring more about uh, using environmentally friendly products and so forth. This could just be one of those socially responsible uh, elements in our society that's gained traction. And it, you know, this might sort of go away on its own because if the if the financial interest isn't there to fight the uh, the prohibition of greyhound racing, then you know, it, it, we, these uh, a prohibition might be able to get passed in the legislature. I, I totally agree. The culture's changing, and that seems the way uh, that it's going to go. And I suspect, in a not too distant future, you won't even have greyhound racing in the state of Florida. You know, I'd like to turn our attention in the time that we have left uh, to discuss, you know, service animals, which is you know a big issue. Uh, you know, in Florida, we have you know a, a large disabled population. Uh, and that one of the there was a recent story on 2020 about emotional support animals, uh, which there's the federal uh, Fair Housing Act, uh, the, the Rehabilitation Act, and the Air Carrier Access Act. These are all federal laws that essentially make allowances for people that have untrained animals that are of therapeutic value uh, for them. Uh, th this is something that is somewhat controversial because it's thought that some people abuse it under some circumstances. On the other hand, there are people that legitimately uh, need, need these emotional support animals for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, what are, what are some of the uh, uh, challenges that, that somebody might face uh, with, a, with an emotional support animal? And, or, or rather, 
Uh, what are some of the steps that somebody would have to take uh, if they're if they have an emotional if they have a disability and they need to use an emotional support animal? Well, uh, I reviewed you know, some, some of the bills in place. In fact, there's a Florida statute, for, uh, Chapter Four or Thirteen, on this, and um, I'm here to tell you that um, um, there is no special certification um, from what I from what I gather. Uh, uh, Disabled individuals are completely entitled to have their service animal, and that service animal can uh, be with them at any restaurant, at uh, it, housing can't be prohibited, common carriers can't get in the way. You mentioned the airlines and the airline industry, they'll let uh, the animal get on the airline uh, for people who claim to have a disability. Uh, there are some restrictions. Uh, if it's too big, and it gets blocking up the hallway or the seat, that sort of thing. It has to go in a, in a um, someplace else on a plane or in a cage where they carry animals. But really, um, it's uh, uh, the statutes are, are, are written strictly for the protection of uh, physical disabilities or emotional uh, problems uh, that people may have. You, uh, uh, and they don't need to prove with any certificate or anything of that sort. Uh, and uh, they can they can bring their animals where they need to bring and them a, now. And a doctor's note will suffice. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know that you need it. Particularly, you know, as you mentioned, there's federal laws, but there's also this our state law here in the state of Florida. And uh, what, uh, for instance, a restaurant owner can do, they can ask certain questions, uh, but it, they have to again be be mindful of. You know, they can ask if it's a service animal and if they need the service animal, that sort of thing. But uh, the only way that they can uh, ask that that animal be excused is if it's a danger to uh, anybody uh, uh, in any way. Um, but it doesn't matter if other people have allergies or if they're just fearful of the animal. It doesn't matter. The person, you know, the animal is allowed to be there in a public place or wherever it may be, uh, so that individual can um, enjoy what we all enjoy. And it has to be, like you said, an eminent. Uh an eminent fear or eminent threat that the animal poses, not just a theoretical, uh, a theoretical fear that somebody might have with the animal. Yeah, precisely. They can't just have a subjective fear. Uh, you have to ex accept, as the law is now written, that uh, someone with a, who's disabled you know, can have their service animal with them. Correct. And, and of course, you know, we always think of dogs and cats as being potentially emotional support animals, but it. It go, this goes on to other animals that are not as domesticated, things like rabbits or even hedgehogs uh, or miniature ponies. This, uh, you know, they don't have to accept, uh, airlines, for example, don't have to accept reptiles or amphibians as, emo as emotional support animals, but they, do, they, they will generally have to make allowances for, uh, for, other, for animals, even if they're not uh, completely domesticated. If they want to avoid a lawsuit, they better. Correct. So... Uh, you know, I'm I'm wondering what your thoughts are, and uh, and Amanda, feel free to to chime in on the a lot of these policies that condominiums have, condominium associations have, where they don't allow pets or they don't allow pets over a certain size. And under those circumstances, sometimes you run into a situation where somebody has to give up their animal. And uh, I mean, have you ever gotten animals that have uh, that day. have come in because of that situation? Every day, and they ask us about training. Uh, there's the Good Dog Foundation where you're, you can go through about 30 hours of training on top of the doctor's note that finally condo associations are saying, okay, well, if, this, if your dog went through this and you are have a doctor's note, you're fine. But, I mean, every single day we get a phone call about someone who's getting evicted or their landlord found out they have a pet and they really need their pet, but they don't care. And, I mean, that's really why we're, we're there. I mean, we're seeing these dogs tied to our fence, and they have they have their vest with them, and it, it doesn't matter sometimes. And the other thing about training, you were talking about training animals, mm -hmm. uh, service dogs that you know traditional service dogs that deal that are guide dogs, for example, for the blind, seeing eye dogs, uh, or other dogs that are uh, used to uh, assist people. For example, someone with muscular dystrophy that can't, uh, you know, pick things up. You know, dogs will be trained to do that for them. Uh, these are usually labs. That's my understanding. Uh, th this is something that takes many hours, you know, hundreds of hours. They uh, start at eight weeks old. 
Right. And this this can be thousands of dollars. I've even heard tens of thousands mm-hmm. of dollars per dog uh, in terms of the number of man hours and what you, you know, having to pay people, professional dog trainers, to train these dogs to then go out and be adopted by uh, disabled uh, persons. So, you know, this is, this is one of the things about the emotional support animals is that they are they can potentially have therapeutic value uh, even though they don't they're not something that takes all of this effort to train Uh, I agree you know petting a dog or a cat and you have anxiety or uh, everything that's going on in the world today and you just have that dog or cat in your lap and you immediately feel calmness and that sometimes is all someone needs great we have just a couple of minutes left Uh, Ken, I'd like for you if you could uh, give out your contact information to our listeners in the event they're in need of your services. Well, I'll be glad to, yes. Uh, con- for, uh, the firm is Laval, Brown, and Ronan, and uh, we're located at 750 uh, South Dixie Highway in Boca Raton. Uh, our phone number is uh, 561-395-0000, and our, uh, uh, we have a website, which is www.bocalaw.com. And uh, call us anytime. We'll be happy to help. Uh, we have uh, several attorneys and, and uh, large staff, and we can address most legal uh, problems. If you can just tell us again what some of your practice areas are. We mentioned criminal defense earlier. Sure. Yeah. Uh, litigation, personal injury, c- uh, criminal uh, defense, but commercial litigation, real estate. Uh, there's medical malpractice, um, uh, some probate wills. Uh, all the general areas that people uh, tend to need help in, we can uh, serve their interests. We've been in Boca Raton uh, for a very long, we might be the, the oldest law firm in Boca Raton at this point, and that's why we have that phone number, 395-0000. So uh, give us a call. If we don't do it, we'll get you to the right lawyer who can in town. Uh, you know, we're, we're running out of time. I would like to give a very special thanks to my guests, uh, Ken Ronan and Amanda Chesler. Uh, please tune in next week. Uh, Tuesday evening from 6 to 6.30, where my guest will be attorney Jeff Molinaro. We'll be discussing the recent uh, teacher cheating scandal in Atlanta and some other uh, legal issues uh, in education. We have just a, f- a few seconds left. If you could tell us how, how you could, you know, your Tri-County uh, Humane Society or Animal Rescue, uh, how people can find you there. Go ahead and, and uh, You take can over. find us on our website, tricountyanimalrescue.com, or give us a call at 561-482-8110. I'd like to give another thanks to my guests. This has been Talk Legal with Jeff Van Trees. Thank you so much, and have a great evening. Thank you for listening to Talk Legal with Jeff Van Trees. Tune in next week for more insightful and exciting information about the law. You can contact Jeff by email at jvt, the number two, law at gmail.com or give them a call at 561-789-6866. That's 561-789-6866. The content of the preceding program, including all statements from the host and guests, is to provide general information and commentary about the law. Under no circumstances does any statement made by a host or guest to a caller or listener constitute legal advice or the formation of an attorney-client relationship, and the material of this program should not be viewed as a substitute for personal consultation with an attorney. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program...